Hey everyone, Dr. Bagbencher here, and let's start off with the second portion of the chapter on strabismus, right? In which we will be studying two conditions, heterotropia and heterophoria. Before we get into this, uh, let me tell you one thing. There are, or there will be a lot of uh, new words in here, right? New terms, new stuff, difficult terms for very simple things, right? Because I don't know why they're doing that. I have no idea. Well, it's in the book, so it's in the book. And we can't ignore that. There are three, three or four, four words for one single term, right? So I'll try to use the most simplest terms of, of all of them, right? But if you're writing them in an exam, I would advise you to use the more complicated, the more official terms, if you say, and that'll be good for you. Let's get straight into it. So the first one, as I said, many, many words for one single thing. I'm sure you all know, you've all, you've all heard the word strabismus by now, right? During any, at any point of your medical career, strabismus or squint, or it is also called heterotropia, right? New word, difficult word, but very commonly used. It is a condition in which their eyes do not properly align with each other when looking at an object or even when you, when not looking at an object, right? This condition is called squint, right? I'm going to use the simplest term. I'm not going to call it strabismus. I'm not going to call it heterotropia. I'm just going to call it squint. So squint is a condition in which the eyes do not properly align whether you're focusing or not, right? And the absence of squint is called orthophoria, another difficult word for a very simple thing. What is orthophoria? Absence of squint, right? For example, me and, and hopefully you, right, who don't have a squint. We have a condition called orthophoria, right? For example, this is a normal guy, right? And what happens is our lines of vision, they're actually parallel to each other, right? They are absolutely straight. And if something was to come, if there was some object placed in front of us, we have the ability to move our eyes in a, in a way which would help us to focus on this object like that. Okay. This process, this, this, this animation, which just happened, this right here, right? When the visual field of this eye and the visual field of this eye, they match up, right? They intersect with each other. This is called fusion, right? No fusion, fusion, right? But let's assume a condition. Let's assume a condition where the guy has a squint, right? In a squint, what will happen is, first of all, his vision will not be parallel, right? One of his eye would be correct. One of his eye might be looking towards the outside or towards the inside, right? And when they start moving, this eye might focus on the subject, but this eye will not focus on the subject because it was in the very beginning out of the line of focus. And we will be seeing animations for that, okay? Don't worry about that. So, strabismus or squint or heterotropia, there are a few clinical types, right? Of These include convergent squint, right? For example, this, these are the eyes of a guy. How would convergent squint appear to you? Well, one of the eye would be looking towards you. The other would be looking a bit medial, right? Towards the nose. Convergent squint, both of their visual fields would converge, right? More than the required amount. Then there is, of course, divergent squint, which is very similar, but opposite, in which one eye is looking towards you, the other is looking towards the outside, right? Difficult terms for both of these are esotropia or esotropia. I don't know how to say that. And then there's exotropia, right? Esotropia for convergent, exotropia for divergent squint. Then there are vertical squints, right? And you can guess by its name that if there's a guy looking at you and if he's looking and one of his eyes looking at you, the other is looking above, that will be called a hypertropia because, because hyper means above, right? Above the usual level. Or if he's or if one of his eyes is like looking downwards, right, he would be suffering from hypotropia, right? So these four basic types, there are two other types, um, encyclotropia and excyclotropia. Let's not talk about that, right? Because that's not very common. That is not as common as this, but you can check it out in your book. So four types, four main types of squint, right? But these are the appearances of squint, how the squint looks like. How the squint has occurred, that is a a whole different story. The etiology of the squint. What is the cause behind the divergent squint? Or what is the cause behind the convergent squint that you're seeing? Right? Or what is the cause behind hypertropia or hypertropia? All four of these could be because of two conditions. They could be because of paralysis. And we know that in paralysis, of course, um, there are certain muscles which are not working 
in the way they should be. So if that paralysis occur, if that paralysis affects the extraocular muscles, of course, we will have a squint, right? Or it could be non-paralytic squint, which does not occur due to paralysis of the muscles. The muscles are working fine. But there is some other reason why the guy has one eye looking straight and the other eye looking towards maybe the outside or the inside or maybe above or below, right? So paralysis or non-paralysis. These are the two etiologies of squint, right? Paralytic type, it is also called non-comitant or non-concomitant as well. Then there is the non-paralytic squint, which is called the competent squint or even concomitant squint, right? C-O-N, add C-O-N at the, at the start. So as I said again, you can make it difficult if you want to, but I'm going to use the most simplest words, the most simplest names, right? Let's talk about non-paralytic squints. A squint which is there even though the muscles are working fine, but there is still a squint. One eye is looking away or one eye is looking towards the other eye, right? So they're not properly aligned. The, the alignment of the eye, the alignment of vision is not proper. Let's read this. And let's read this very, very carefully. So a non-paralytic squint is a type of a squint where the deviation of one eye from the other, of course, because there is deviation, there, because it's squint, there is deviation. But the deviation of one eye from the other remains constant. It remains same, right? It does not change if you look left and right. So the deviation of one eye from the other remains same in all directions of gaze. This is very important. And you might be thinking, why am I stressing out so much on this? Because let's read the other type, the no, the, the paralytic squint. Let's, let's go and read the paralytic squint for a second. A type of squint where the deviation of one eye with respect to the other is not constant. The first one was constant, non-paralytic was constant, the paralytic is not constant, right? And can change over certain types of movements, right? Let's go back. A type of squint where the deviation of one eye from the other remains constant in all directions of gaze. And this other point is very important as well. Both eyeballs move in an identical fashion by the same amount, right? So if one eye is moving like, I don't know, 10 centimeters up the other which has the squint it'll also move by 10 centimeters up right for example in this diagram so if let's see this is a guy this is one of his eye this is the other eye which has a little bit of a squint right it's a little bit above than this one so in a non-paralytic squint if this eye starts to look down by like five millimeters this will also move down by five millimeters and the next thing you'd see is this eye would be completely down here this will be in the middle so there's always a squint right there's a constant squint and both the eyeballs move in an identical fashion by the same amount i cannot stress this enough and you'll understand why i'm so much forcing my point here let's 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 actually see what's going on so i made this little animation of a non-paralytic squint but a divergent kind of squint, right? Um, divergent, you can clearly see one is looking straight, the other is diverging from its normal line of gaze, right? So it's a divergent squint, but it is a non-paralytic type. So in non-paralytic, as we studied, both of them will move by the same amount, right? Regardless of their initial position, both of them would be, would be moving by the same amount. Let's see what I mean. Let's say you tell this patient to look towards you. Let's imagine this is you, right? This is a doctor. You're a doctor and, and this patient is first not looking at you and now you ask the patient to look at you. What will happen is he'll focus his gaze on you. He'll start looking at you. He will try to do fusion. Just like that. Notice, notice the movement. Try looking at this place right here. Let me go back. You can see very clearly that both of them are moving by the same amount, right? It's not something like this is moving a little bit and this is moving a lot, right? But because there is a squint, this is out of the way, right? This cannot properly focus on this. So it is a divergent squint, right? But a non-paralytic type. This is the most characteristic property of it. Both of them are moving identically by the same amount. I keep saying this again and again, but this is very, very necessary. A type of squint where the deviation of one eye from the other remains same and both eyeballs move in an identical fashion by the same amount. What could be the causes of a squint, of a non-paralytic squint? Well, refractive errors. Ref certain refractive errors like hypermetropia, which is farsightedness, myopia, 
which is nearsightedness, the one which I'm suffering from, and a lot of medical students actually suffer from this. And then there's astigmatism, right? We will be studying these in the next lectures, but astigmatism for now, just for your satisfaction, it is a problem in the cornea. It is also called a cylindrical refractive error, right? And we will, don't worry, we'll be studying all these in detail. Then there is the hereditary cause, right? Non-paralytic squint could be because of, because of genes, right? Down syndrome can cause a squint, which is non-paralytic, of course. Cerebral palsies can cause squints. Retinoblastomas can also cause squints. Retinoblastomas, we will be reading retinoblastomas in the retina chapter, right? So these few factors, I would like you to memorize these. So let's, let's move forward. Non-paralytic squint, which is divergent. See, the eye is moving outside. I already showed you, this, showed you this diagram. Let's see. We bring an object in front of it. One of his, the correct eye focuses. The wrong eye does not, or the squinted eye does not focus. Then we have the other type, the convergent squint, right? And we, and remember from the first diagram that we drew, convergent squint was a squint in which one of the eye was looking towards the medial side. One of, one of it was looking straight. The other was a bit towards the medial side. So if you place an object here, now because this is a paralytic squint, uh, sorry, a non-paralytic squint, both of them will move by the exact same amount. So let's move them. You see, fusion does not occur. It occurs at this point, of course, but we are not looking at this point. We are looking at this point, right? So fusion does not occur. So notice again, notice these eyeballs. Equal amount of movement. Equal amount of movement. Let's talk about the some of the clinical features of a non-paralytic squint, right? Well, it's usually congenital, uh, develops in small children. It may be present at birth or it may develop in a, in a very small infant, right? Like five or six months, right? And it usually does not occur. I mean, it rarely occurs like in a, in a guy who is like 20 years old. No, it does. It, that does not happen. That is actually one of the biggest differences between a non-paralytic and paralytic squint. A non-paralytic, a paralytic squint occurs in old older people, right? And we'll be studying that, don't worry. The ocular movements are not restricted. As I said in the very first slide, all of them can move anywhere they want because there is no paralysis, right? In paralysis, in a paralytic squint, this would not be the case because some of the muscles of the eye are not working. So the ocular movements would be restricted. And this, because there is no paralysis, the ocular movements are not restricted. They're as normal as you and I. And here's an interesting thing. You might expect that because one, because the vision is not fusing, you, you might, you are seeing two images and the guy would suffer from double images or diplopia. Well, that's not the case. There is infrequent diplopia. That does not happen. And that is because of a very genius thing that the human body does. They develop something called the lazy eye. And we'll be studying lazy eye in detail, but in the relevant chapter. But for now, let's imagine this condition, right? Let's imagine this is a, an infant, a small child, right? And he has a squint. He cannot really bring both of his eyes to focus on things. So in one eye, in this eye, he can see this perfectly. In this other eye, he cannot see it. And that confuses the brain. It really teases the brain, right? And the brain thinks, hey, you know what? I've got one correct eye, right? I'm going to make the best use of it. And what does it do? It shuts off or it ignores the innervation, it ignores the vision from the bad eye, right? And that is called lazy eye. It's a condition in which the brain shuts off the sensory innervation from the bad eye, the eye which cannot focus, right? And the good eye, okay, fine, it does not have binocular vision because you have only one eye working right now, but at least it's focused, right? At least you're not having diplopia. You're not having headaches because of diplopia. So that's one of the adaptive mechanism that the brain does to develop lazy eye. So infrequent diplopia due to development of lazy eye, primary and secondary deviations are the same. Very, very high yield. Because this is probably the only thing that you will observe in the very first second, right? This will be the thing which you'll be looking for. You'll be testing for this. And that will help you differentiate between a non-paralytic and a paralytic squint, right? Uh, don't worry, we'll talk about paralytic squint as well, and then we will compare both of these, right? So don't worry. So what is a primary and what is a secondary deviation? Uh, new words, right? New terminologies to learn. I told you in the beginning of this lecture, there are a lot of new words to learn in this, right? So let's imagine this situation back again. Divergent squint, which is non-paralytic, right? Let's imagine a bit of a different scenario now. 
Let's say we bring an object in front of this person who is suffering from non-paralytic divergent squint and we we cover one of his eyes, right? We cover, let's say we cover his bad eye, right? We covered his bad eye, right? And we told him to, hey, hey, just folk, just use your right eye. The, not right, I mean the correct eye, right? Not this right eye. The correct eye and focus and focus on, on this picture over here. And don't care about this one, right? Let this one flow freely. And what does this guy do? He focuses his attention on the subject with his correct eye. Look what happens. He brings his gaze there. And you can see, because I said it before, I'm said it, I said it like a hundred times, that both of these move with the same intensity. They both move by the same amount. Let's see it again. Exact same amount, parallel to each other, right? Now, as you can see, the movement of the correct eye forced the movement of the squinted eye, right? The movement of this eye caused the deviation of this eye, right? The movement of the correct eye caused the deviation of the incorrect or squinted eye. This deviation is called the primary deviation, right? And because we said that they both move by the same amount, if this moves by like five degrees, this will also move by five degrees, right? And the same is the case when we do the opposite thing. Let's imagine, let's imagine we tell this patient to, hey, cover, let's cover this correct eye right now and let's use this squinted eye, right? Use your squinted eye and focus on this. What he does, he uses his squinted eye. They move by the exact same amount as you saw. And now the squinted eye is looking at this image, right? And this correct eye is way off target. What is the point of this? Well, the deviation caused by the squinted eye, the deviation caused in the correct eye by the movement of the squinted eye right here, this is called a secondary deviation, right? So if this forces this to move, that will be a primary deviation. If this, the movement of this one causes the movement of this, this correct one right here, that would be called a secondary deviation. And these will both be the exact same, right? You can see here, they're moving by the same amount. Exact same. And then again, exact same, right? And you might be thinking, why am I so stressing out on this? Once again, you will see it when we talk about paralytic squints, right? Then you'll realize why I was so much insisting on the equal movements, right? So, diagnostic point. Primary and secondary deviations are the same. The correct one affects the incorrect one and the incorrect one affects the correct one in the exact same way, right? Now, let's talk about paralytic squints, right? When there is a paralysis and when a few of the extraocular muscles are not working ideally, right? What would happen in that situation? Let's first read very, very carefully once again. So a paralytic squint is a type of a squint where the deviation of one eye with respect to the other is not constant. It was constant in the first eye, right? And it can change over certain movements, right? Depending upon where the paralysis has occurred. There is a squint, of course, because it's a paralytic squint after all. And, but the eye movements are not identical and may not move by the exact same amount. That is what I'm talking about. Let's look at this animation. Here is a squint, which is divergent, right? We can see it. It's towards the outside. Let's not, let me not say this again and again. It's boring you. So here's a divergent squint. Ah, oh, I said it again. And it's paralytic. So let's see. Let's bring an object in front of this guy. And let's tell this guy to focus on this. There it is. Very, very clear. The first eye, the eye, this, this eye over here is moving a lot. This eye is not moving by the same amount. So the deviation between these two is not constant, right? It is changing continuously and they're not moving by the exact same amount look at these places it's very very apparent okay look let, let, let me move them one is moving a lot this one is moving a lot this one is not moving at all or it's moving very very less this is paralytic squint this is typical of paralytic squint right let's read again a type of squint where there is deviation of one eye with respect to the other of course because it's a squint but it is not constant and it can change over certain movements and 
There is a squint, but the eye movements are not identical and may not move by the same amount. They're not moving by the same amount. Not moving by the same amount. And it can be caused due to nerve lesions of either the third, fourth, or sixth cranial nerves. We saw the divergent squint, the paralytic form. We bring an object in front of it. It does not move by the same amount. Then we can also see a convergent squint as well, a paralytic convergent squint, right? You can see it's converged, it's converged towards the inside. Same exact experiment, bring an object in front of it. The one eye moves a lot, the other does not move that much, right? See? So, let's talk about a few clinical features of paralytic squint. Sudden onset, right? It occurs out of nowhere because generally nerve lesions, they occur out of nowhere, right? They don't always develop slowly, right? Sudden onset, and it can occur at any stage. Compare that to non-paralytic squint. When we study, it's usually congenital most of the time. And if it's not congenital, it's infantile, right? It's like when the child is very, very, very young, like, for example, a few months, five or six months, right? But this can occur at any stage. A paralytic, a guy with a paralytic squint could be like 30 years of age. And it's, and this is sudden. Paralytic squint is sudden. The other one was gradual. And diplopia is the main symptom. Very, very high yield. Remember, we said that in a non-paralytic squint, although there is a squint, one eye is looking the other way, right? And it should cause diplopia. But there was no diplopia. There was very less diplopia because of the development of lazy eye, right? Remember when we talk about how the nervous system shuts off the bad eye and only uses information from the correct eye? That does not happen in this case. Well, at least not in the start. Then, ocular movement limitation. Remember, in the first one, we said there is no limitation on movement of eyes, right? Because there is no problem with the extraocular muscle. There is just a problem, oops, there is just a problem of alignment. Or here, there is ocular movement limitation. Because, for example, if you damage, like, the sixth cranial nerve, you cannot abduct your eye. There is an ocular movement limitation. That is not the case with the first one. And here's the important thing, the VIP thing in all of this. The secondary deviation is much greater than the primary deviation. Let's recall what is a primary and what is a secondary deviation. A primary deviation is the deviation which is caused by the correct eye on the incorrect eye, right? A secondary deviation is caused by the incorrect eye on the correct eye, right? But what happens in paralytic squint is that the secondary deviation is much greater than the primary deviation. Let's see what I mean. The same experiment again. You ask this guy to cover up his bad eye, right, initially, and tell, tell him that, hey, look at this happy face with your correct eye. And that is exactly what he does. He focuses his gaze on the object, right, through his correct eye. Now, now, once, let me do that once again, and I want you to really closely observe the, the incorrect eye. You see, the incorrect eye is moving very, very less compared to the correct eye, right? And that is the highlight feature of paralytic squint, right? I did say that they do not move by the same amount, right? You can see here, the primary deviation is very less, right? The deviation which is caused in this, by the movement of this, is very very less look at that let me play it again this moves more the other moves less the secondary deviation is much greater than the primary deviation let's see the secondary deviation here's the primary deviation right now we cover up this eye right and we tell him to focus his gaze on the object where this incorrect with this squinted eye right i'm not even sure if squinted is a word but i'm just using it what we said we said that the secondary deviation is much greater and look at this. Behold. Oh my goodness me. That is a lot of deviation. Let's let's do that again. It's it's fun. Oh my god. They are not moving by the same amount because it's of course paralytic. And the deviation caused in this one by the movement of this one, which is second which is of course called secondary deviation, this deviation is very, very large than the primary deviation that we saw. This is the primary deviation. This is a secondary deviation, right? This is the characteristic feature of a paralytic squint. You might see a divergent squint 
right? And how would you determine that this divergent squint is paralytic or not? By this test. Simple, easy, nothing so difficult about it at all. Except, of course, making the animations, which was a real pain. So, sudden onset can occur at any stage, right? Diplopia is the main symptoms because there is no lazy eye. Ocular movement is limited. And secondary deviation is much, much greater than the primary deviation. Let's compare it to the first one. Where is the first one? Clinical features of the non-paralytic squint. Usually congenital. Ocular movements are not restricted. Infrequent diplopia. Primary and secondary deviations are the same. Compare it with the first one again. Sudden onset can occur at any stage. Diplopia. Ocular movement is limited. Secondary deviation is much, much greater than primary deviation. That's about it, right? The two kinds of squints, the two kinds of strabismus, the two kinds of heterotropias. And I think we are done with both of these. If you did not understand this, I would advise you to go back and read this lecture from the very first, right? Because there were a lot of new terms injected again and again, it might have broken the flow of the lecture. But if you, if you go back and if you read this again, I promise you, you will understand it, right? It's not that difficult at all. Now we have another condition, and this is, a, I promise, this is the last condition, right? Here, here is this very interesting condition called heterophoria. Let's just jump straight into the animation first. Here's a condition. You can see that it's towards the outside. Here's the normal condition. This guy is looking out into the blue, right? And you suddenly bring in an object in front of his eye and tell him, hey, focus both of your eyes on this object. Now, in the previous conditions, we saw that one of his eye, the correct eye, that is, it could focus on the object here, but his incorrect eye, although it would try to focus, but because it was so out in the first place, and because, of course, we know that they move by the same amount, it could not actually focus on it, right? But look at this condition. We bring an object, although it is deviated towards the outside. Aha! Something new, right? Look at it again. This eye is moving less. This eye is moving more, right? This guy has the ability to focus on stuff. When a, an object is brought in front of him, he loses that squint, right? But when that object is taken away from him, he develops squint once again. This is called latent squint. This, is condi this condition is called heterophoria. Let's read. A heterophoria is a condition when there is misalignment only in the absence of fusion. See this. There is no fusion right now. There is a misalignment. When fusion takes place, the misalignment disappears. Let's bring an object. Let's fuse the vision. Ah, there you are. Misalignment finishes, right? They are as proper as a normal eye right now. When fusion takes place, the misalignment disappears. It reappears when the fusion is broken, right? So, here's an interesting one. You will see a guy who will come to your clinic, who will come to the hospital, and when you try to do a test on him, you would say, look at me, and suddenly, a second before he had a squint, and now he is not having squint. That is called heterophoria, right? And there are two common types, exophoria and esophoria, and I'm sure you can understand it just by their name, that exophoria is when the guy, when it, he's, when he's not focusing, one of, his eye, one of his eye is pointing towards the outside, and esophoria is that when he's not focusing, one of his eyes is bent towards the inside. But when he focuses, of course, both of these conditions simultaneously disappear. Right? Here's an exophoria. It's towards the outside. You bring in an object. It's all fine. You take that object away. He's, he has exophoria once again. Here's another. Here's esophoria, deviated towards the inside. You bring an object. He corrects his vision. You bring that object even more close and he still corrects his vision. Right? Heterophoria is this condition. Latent squint. There's a squint, but there's also no squint, right? You can think of it like that. Symptoms of heterophoria include intermittent diplopia. When? When the guy is not focusing. The, the moment the guy focuses, diplopia is gone. That is why it is called intermittent because it's sometimes there and it's sometimes not there. Intermittent squint. It is there when he's not focusing. It vanishes when he focuses, right? Headache and eye ache. Photophobia. Okay, if you really want to add in stuff. Difficulty in reading. And you would diagnose this by this very amazing test called the cover-uncover test, right? As I said, 
When the, the moment you tell this guy to look at you, he'll be all right. So how would you diagnose? Well, there are specific tests, the cover and cover test. Uh, that test is very complicated, right? And trust me, even if I try my best, and believe me, I did try, I could not explain it as good as this other lecture that I'm, I'm gonna link up here, right? Cover and cover test, very high yield to know, right? It is used to diagnose heterophoria, and treatment is prism glasses and surgery. And I think that's it. And that will be about it. Thank you very much for your patience. I'm sorry if you could not learn it properly from me. I tried my best. But if you did learn, then why not consider hitting that subscribe button and also maybe hitting the like button as well. That'll motivate me to add more fancy stuff to my presentation and make it more presentable, right? Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the next one.